Hi, Stas. It's great to see you again. And um, we're, today we're talking about fermentation uh, frequently asked questions because I know you get a few in the shop and we get a few um, over the phone and, and the internet um, on yep. fermentation. What would you say is one of your most commonly asked questions from whether it's a new home brewer who walks in the shop with a fermentation issue? Yeah, uh, I reckon probably the one we get at least once a week is... Um, my beer's not bubbling, is it done? Or a variation of that question, my beer is still bubbling after four weeks, is it finished? Or what, what, is, should it be still fermenting? Um, <laughs> is, two, I, I, op opposite ends, two, two opposite ends of the spectrum there. But it's often the same problem. Um, so for me, uh, what I always say is that the only, and I'm, I won't, I can't take credit for this. I've, I can't remember exactly where I heard it from, but the only thing that an airlock bubbling is going to tell you is that there's air bubbling through the airlock. Like it's, it has no relation to if it's, if your beer is fermenting or not. Um, you can often get a false reading, like, you know, you go to bed and it's, bubbling then the air temperature around cools down the head space comes in. <laughs> the head space cools down and contracts you're asleep you don't see the bubbles going in and then you wake up when the when it's starting to warm up again and that air is starting to expand and you get this constant you know stream of bubbles in the morning but so it's whether the airlock is bubbling or not is really no indication of whether it's fermenting or not. The only way that you can tell if it's fermenting is use a hydrometer um, or a refractometer, but you need to convert that reading. But check the gravity is basically what you need to do to check if, if a beer is still fermenting and, you know, take a sample, measure it and do that over a couple of days. If it's still fermenting, uh, you should see that gravity continue to drop, to drop um, until you reach about, I, mean, I guess, a typical beer. Um, FG would be around, what, 1008 to 1012, depending on what you're using. Um, but, yeah, um, so that that's that's what I get asked in the store almost every week from a, a home brewer calling in or, or walking in the shop. So, um, an excellent answer you gave. And one of the things I certainly took away stats is if you haven't invested $10 in a hydrometer, you know, you, 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 and, and like you said, um, you know, you can even just leave the hydrometer in the brew as one option. Um, then you lift the lid off and have a look. I mean, some people do get so yeah. precious about is my, um, you know, maybe they start with a plastic MP 30 litre fermenter. Is it sealed tight? And yet you'll hear experienced home brewers say, throw away the lid, throw away the airlock, just put some cling wrap over the top and have a look in. And, and to a certain degree, they're absolutely right. Yeah, um, I, I certainly did open fermentation just with some sanitised alfoil over the top of the carboy for 18 months. And, you know, I had big blow offs and had to like pick the foil off and clean up and re sanitize. I had no issues with with uh infections um but it's yeah it, it is a, an obsession and because i guess new home brewers talk about must be clean must be sanitary and they worry about things getting in um which is fair be, enough yeah absolutely would that be another frequent asked question you get about what temperature should i be fermenting my beer at uh, yes, uh, and a lot of the we sell we still sell an awful lot of uh, cans, um, so kit and kilo brews, and you know on the on the instructions they say you know ferment between twenty two and twenty eight degrees or whatever it is, and it, I always say well you can but it's it's if you want the best flavour in your beer. Um, it's better to go on the lower end of that scale. I mean, I, I guess they want to try and uh, make it accessible and not so scary. Say like, oh, it has to be between 18 and 19 degrees and that's it. And you don't want people who are starting out to have stalled fermentations. And so, um, I yeah. I think as a good rule of thumb, Stas, when we get the questions um, as well um, about, 
you know, if it's an ale, um, think about 18 to 22, start at the lower yeah. end of the range and work your way up. If you're after more yeah. esters, higher end. And then, you know, um, think 10 to 12 for a lager. Um, yeah. And we, do, we yeah. do get questions when they're doing a lager. Sorry to keep going this no, right. but We do get questions when people are doing a lager going, I haven't got a fermentation. And you're like, well, you might have. Well, no, I can't see a big, massive crowds in. Well, that's because lagers are bottom fermenting yeast and it might be doing its work and it's cooler and it's doing a lot of work down the bottom of the fermenter. Um, again, get your hydrometer out or pop a tilt in there, whatever you need to that's do it. to um, get some readings <clears throat> and understand what your beer is doing. Um, and the, the other th slight nuance on that is, you know, when you're uh, fermenting an ale, uh, or of lager, when you drop the temperature, that yeast is going to ferment slower because it's organic. It's an organic reaction, and when you decrease the temperature, it happens slower. So people, you know, if they have a really hot day and their fermenter gets up to twenty-eight degrees, they're like, "Oh, it hasn't moved. It's been two days. It was really warm." Uh, I, I think my yeast is still so again. Take a reading with your hydrometer. It may have just thrash through that beer and it may be done but you're not going to know unless you check your your uh, gravity with a hydrometer um but yeah don't be surprised if your lager which is fermenting at 12 degrees takes a good two weeks when your ales normally take four or five days because that's just how the chemistry works um what would be another frequently asked question you'd get with regards to fermentation <coughs> Um, probably to do with stuck fermentation. Uh, uh, yeah. You know, yeah. It's like they might be experimenting with, uh, sometimes it's not a stuck fermentation. Uh, sometimes they've been brewing ales and all of a sudden they try a milk stout and they go, it's not going below 1020. And it's like, what beer did you brew? It's like it's a milk stout. How much lactose did you use? Lactose is a non-fermentable sugar, so you're going to expect your um your finished gravity to be higher and again i think we did i think i did a video on this about the forced fermentation um right. yeah where you you can do just take a little sample chuck yep. bread yeast or whatever you want in it give it a good shake and leave it and see if it moves but you know if you're using maltodextrin or corn syrup and lactose they're uh, largely non-fermentable so they're going to increase your final gravity um but if it, if it is a stuck fermentation, you know, you check your fermentation temperature. Like, did it get really cold overnight? You may have, the yeast might have flocculated out because it's just got too cold. Sometimes a gentle rouse uh, of the fermenter, just a gentle swirl. You don't want to oxygenate um, or and then try and boost that temperature up into the warmer temps to try and get it going again. That could, that could start fermentation again. Um, if you do a, if you've tried that and that hasn't worked, you can do your force ferment test. If you're still getting um, a drop in ferment in gravity from your force ferment test, then it's probably start time to think about maybe I need to repitch either another packet of the same yeast or just try and chuck something in there that's going to finish it off, whether it be depending on the beer style it could be a USO5 it could be a champagne yeast it could be a whatever um I think we, we get a few calls too for people who are pitching a liquid yeast and they're expecting it to take off you know like a frog in a sock um within like um a couple of hours of pitching and yeah. um sometimes it can take up to 24 to 48 hours for the lag phase to to complete so um and then if they ring up in a real panic um, and it's, you know, they're closer to the 48 hours and the 24, say, um, and then they'll, they'll think, what can you do? Can you send us some more dry yeast? I always say to people, keep a couple of packets of Nottingham or, or USO5 yeah. in the fridge at all times for yeah. emergencies like these. You know, your best yeah. friend in the unlikely event that you have got um, a, a, a liquid yeast pitch that's gone past its viability or maybe you underpitched where you should have made a starter or something. Um, yeah. You've got that back up because I guess every day or hour that you're leaving a beer with 
um, not enough yeast, healthy yeast in there. Um, there's an mm. opportunity for other bugs and bacteria to get in there and start doing the job. Yeah, that's right. You, you want that yeast to be the most dominant thing in your beer. Yeah. I always recommend people look at that Lalamond pitching calculator um, yep. because I, so many people who are new to home brewing maybe think, oh, I can get by with one sachet, but if they put the gravities in and the um, and the style of beer they're chasing, and then it's, it, they can see it needs one and a half. Look, get two packets, over pitch. You'd rather over pitch yep. than under pitch. Um, yeah, have a good it. healthy fermentation. Um, and um, I guess. It, the other, th any other questions that you've had asked um, um, regularly around fermentation, and and maybe they don't have to be regularly asked questions, but it's something that um, you think is a, a tip that people should always consider. Uh, there's, I think there's more people sort of exploring the idea of temperature controlled uh, options for their beers. Um, <clears throat> rather than just going, oh, I brew dark beers in the summer and drink them in the winter and I brew the lagers in the winter to drink them in the summer, um, you were starting to get some really affordable devices, whether it be like an Inkbird temperature controller, which you plug in an, an old fridge into and it just turns it on and off um, uh, when necessary. Uh, or, you know, you've got your STC 1000s or the more upmarket, like your glycol systems and your grandfather conical fermenters. Um, having the ability to temperature control makes it a lot more consistent. And I think people looking for the next step up when they control the temperature of the fermentations, there's a lot less stress about constantly going and checking, oh, is it is it right? I mean, you don't have to go to a... Uh, to, uh, like an electronically control, uh, electronic controller for temperature fermentation. You can use a, an ice bath or wet towels with a fan on it, or it, you can do a lot of low tech stuff, but it um, requires a lot more attention. Um, and for the like the $60, $70 cost of a temperature control, and a lot of people in Australia have an old beer fridge or something that sitting in the garage it's it's such an easy and reliable um solution you know the um i'm, I'm hearing you loud and clear the SDS, i think um you know a little pop a little post on your neighborhood facebook group anyone got an old fridge um and whether you um and then like you say get a temperature controller between your fridge and uh, maybe a heat pad but don't put it directly under the beer maybe Put it on a, yeah. a shelf below, an inch or two below, and that'll just turn it on, turn it off. Great. We can control that fermentation if it's a lager, 10 to 12, if it's an yeah. ale, 18 to 22. Then the other thing is, you know, if we want to do a diastole rest with a lager, and we'll get to that, yeah. what is a diastole rest, you can yeah. do it so easily. And then if I want to cool it down um, my ale after a heavy dry hop or whatever to do a conditioning, I can do all of that in the one vessel, in the one fridge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yep. Never invest uh, a better coin. So on that question, what is a diacetyl rest and should I do one for a lager? Uh, so, yeah, diacetyl rest, uh, during fermentation, the yeast produces pre uh, precursors to diacetyl. Now, diacetyl is that sort of, um, sort of cream corn, um the flavour in and that's quite often in lagers, which is not desirable. Um, and sorry, I'm thinking of DMS. Yeah. Butterscotch. Yeah. Butterscotch. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Butterscotch. Yeah. Buttery buttercorn. Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 <sighs> it's late. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, you get, you have the precursors made in. Uh, fermentation at the end of fermentation when all the the easy stuff for the yeast to um, to eat is is used up the yeast starts you know going into survival mode and say what else can I metabolize and it starts eating up these um, the precursors to diacetyl and um, to encourage that you want to raise the temperature up so the yeast are more active more energized um, to try and make them you know 
keep consuming and metabolizing these anything that they can right until the end until there's absolutely nothing else and then they'll flocculate out so it's really good practice to do it in a lager uh, it's good practice to do it in any beer but especially in a lager just there's a lot less flavor um, to hide behind um, and uh, for a lager you don't really need to go all the way up to 22 degrees um, if you're fermenting around 12 18 19 degrees is is plenty of um, elevated temperature for a, for a lager you can yeah for three days and you don't want to be you don't want to go from 12 all the way up to 18 um, in one hit usually the line in the sand is once you're about 50 percent attenuated you start bumping up the temperature one to two degrees per day until you hit that 18 and 19 degrees this is for a lager um, and then let it sit there for three days or until you can't detect any uh, diacetyl in there and there's a test you can do uh, the Rockstar Brewer had a video about a hack to how, how to like test for it's it's something ketones I, I'm forgetting the name of the precursor um, but yeah so um, I'll, I'll put a link to that in the, the video uh, you, you basically take a sample in a bottle heat the bottle up to 80 degrees in some boiling water cool it down and taste it and that that process will, if if there are any precursors to diacetyl, it'll um, present itself. Interesting. Yeah, I, mean, I've, I remember seeing a good presentation, I think, um, from Gillian Mordera at Sour and Piglets at uh, the mm. last Australian National Home Brewers Conference, which was a couple of years ago now because of the, we're supposed to have won this year with COVID. But um, uh, he was sort of saying, you, you may not necessarily need to do one, but not doing one would mean another two weeks at, 10 to 12 degrees so like a lot of things lager brewing we've borrowed from the commercial brewers world um, and um, we're raising the temperature to accelerate that process you know just like fermentation under pressure um, yeah. is a trick that um, and, and, and you know brewing at a warmer temperature is a trick to do a fast lager but um, yeah I think um, if we to address our you know beginner frequently asked questions probably the most thing to watch out for the lager is don't be too overly anxious if you don't see a vigorous krausen like you have on your ales you've brewed um, like you said give it more time um, mm -hmm. and um, by all means do a diacetyl rest as an insurance policy um, that you're um, going to have a good clean crisp lager yeah um, I mean I've so just on that, I've also fermented lagers at 16, 18 degrees, and I know a couple of breweries ferment S23 at 18 degrees, and their pilsners taste pretty good. So it, it's not a hard and fast rule. If you treat your yeast right and you're controlling all other variables, you can sort of push the envelope a bit, but, um, but that's getting a bit I mean, more advanced. I'm, I'm, guilty as charged of doing um, what I called high-vis brewing because all of our fridges were full of hops, including the fermentation fridge we're speaking about. And um, I just threw an Aldi jacket around a fermenter and wanted to lager in the summer. And of course it was warm. And I'm pretty sure that was running it because I had a tilt in there. Um, like you say, sort of 16 to 18 degrees, S23 yeah. as well. And it yeah. came out really clean. I was expecting some esters and things like that. I was surprised. Yeah. Um, so, you know, lager yeast are probably a lot more... Um, robust and tolerant than we give them um, credit for. Just like yeah. I think brewing as a process is quite robust. Any other yeah. um, frequently asked questions before we draw to a close on fermentation? And we do encourage all of our wonderful listeners to write in with any FAQ because we, we can group them under different topics. Um, yeah. Anything else you get asked with regards to fermentation? Um, um, I guess people maybe uh, they hear the term primary and secondary fermentation and they're confused yep. as in are they necessary because a lot of people get into kegs and do, do I, what's secondary fermentation because a lot of the literature they read it talks about primary and then secondary and they don't really racking? understand you mean yeah. the concept of racking I think that's that's probably a good one to, for us to explore a little bit yeah racking as oh, where, where yeasting off. So, yeasting. yeah yep. yeah of so if we talk about go back to the primary and secondary fermentation 
Uh, I guess primary fermentation is the, the phase when you've got your wort and you uh, inoculate it or pitch your yeast onto it, that first fermentation is called the primary fermentation. If you're going into bottles, uh, you, you wait until the primary fermentation has finished uh, and then you, if you just, if you then go into package, you put it into bottles uh, with some dextrose or some sugar, and then it undergoes a secondary fermentation with cap on. And rather than it venting through the airlock, it it carbonates the the beer in the bottle via a secondary fermentation. So that's one idea of secondary fermentation. If you're doing like a fruit beer, you might have your primary fermentation with your your grains and then rack that beer on top of some fruit. And of course, you're introducing more sugar, which, and then it'll undergo a secondary fermentation. Um, so that's that's kind of the two terms that are frequently used for, for, for what's a secondary fermentation, what's a primary fermentation. Yeah, Any, and I, anything to add? Well, to I'm, it's interesting. I'm smiling a little bit here because um, I'm thinking way back when, when – um, you know, I started brewing, you know, pre, pre the internet and reading old books and things like that. And I used to always um, talk about primary fermentation as, you know, the, that vigorous start of the fermentation, say the first three to five days where the uh, okay. yeast is eating all those easily available um, sugars. So the simple sugars, but then Blue the coast, secondary, yeah. Fer- yeah, exactly. And then the secondary fermentation is when, okay, now we're uh, okay. easy to yeah. grab sugars. Now I've got to get into the... Um, those complex carbohydrates, the multi yeah, trios, and yeah. all of those sort of things, and it just takes a little bit longer. Um, yeah. But um, like you say, and, and, and you know, normally about three days. And yeah. traditionally, we would in that primary fermentation, we see that crows and rise, all that yeast get produced, and then that is where, say, if you're a commercial brewer, you would um, and it'd be in a uni tank, and you would um, dump yeast yeah. out the bottom of the cone, um, and then you would. You want to yeast off. Um, however, mm-hmm. again, an old rule of thumb with home brewing was two weeks primary, um, then rack it off the yeast for two weeks secondary um, or conditioning time. So similar to what you were talking about there, um, yes. and and you know racking or conditioning, and then into the package beer. But and and I guess, gosh. Like you mentioned there, we could probably say thirdary fermentation or fourthary form fermentation if I'm doing something with fruit. Um, in the case of a sour, or yeah. like you said, I'm going to do a natural fermentation in the bottle. You again are going to see a repeat of that process. So it was old rule of thumb used to be: if you don't want to rack it and you just want to leave it two weeks, pretty much the job's done uh, fermenting. Then you'd turn your fridge down or whatever and let it condition for two weeks or the yeast falls out. Then you would package it. But remember, you've got to have that package beer sitting at 18 to 22 again for another two weeks. Then you pop it in the fridge. That's six weeks. But now I think, again, in generation, I want everything instantly. And yesterday and, and um, today, it's we want a Quebec Palau in five days or something <laughs> crazy or what is it, beer to keg in seven. So yeah. there is so much... Um, and, and and understanding of the whole process of what happens has changed a lot in the last 15, 20 years as well. Um, there's been an awful lot of research um, from the commercial uh, breweries and, and home brewers and um, and understanding the process. Uh, but yeah, there's I, I guess when you're a, when you're a new brewer, we just illustrated it like we're we're fairly um, we've been around a bit and we have different ideas of what secondary fermentation is and it's like it's the same word but it means a different thing and neither of them are necessarily wrong they're just the different use of the word and um, and easy um and i, I the old um what did we say um uh, how meant how sent how received so putting people send an, an email or post a post to a forum <laughs> someone might be meaning and asking a question about one thing and other people are receiving it with their knowledge from their background and going, oh, what's this talking about here? I, I thought he was asking a question about racking or, um, you know, things like this. Um, but I think what we're seeing now is no one's really racking at homebrew level. So, you know, it used to have the <coughs> two plastic fermenters or whatever and you drop it out the tap from one into yeah. the second um, to get it off the yeast and then you do that 
cold conditioning, almost like a bright tank, um, mm. back in the thing. And then I decide, okay, now I'm going to bottle or keg. I don't yeah. hear of many people doing that. Everyone's got like a conical or a firm oh, or yeah. something. The only exception would be people who bulk prime and they want to rack off, rack off into a bottling bucket, but then they almost admit they don't necessarily let it sit. It just, it's, it's, it's racking off to try and keep all the trube and yeast and stuff out of the bottles. Um, sorry, sorry, I was just going to say, I was looking at a blog from, um, um, Brad of Bearsmith and, and, um, you know, the case against secondary fermentation or why would you um, do a, um, a racking? And that is one of the key reasons why you would rack off is what you just mentioned to get mm. off all that tube and off all that yeast. Um, and I guess if you were bottling and you're a home brewing you gen- and you wanted a clear beer, mm. racking makes a lot of sense. Um, and if you want to rack, you can do that, but you just have to make sure you're doing that with clean and sanitary conditions. Um, well, and that's, that's the other thing. It's a, it's a trade off because every time you move that beer from one vessel to another, right. you risk infection, you risk oxidation yeah. and yeah. it's a, it's a cost, it's, it's a cost benefit analysis, I guess, or a risk benefit. Um, <laughs> more often than not, I'm seeing people post pictures to their, um, you know, whether it's Aussie Homebrewers Forum or, or, or something like that on Facebook. Um, and they've got, you know, an affordable um, plastic conical for men to like a firm Zilla or something like that. Um, and um, it's just so easy to turn a little tap and drop the yeast out the bottom, get rid of it. Um, oh, yeah, I, I, I'm using a uni, a 30 litre keg uni tank with a floating dip tube and I, I cold crash for th- three or four days and then rack directly into a, a keg. I don't. I don't That's know. the other thing I was going to say. Are you seeing more and more people go straight to keying? Because um, yeah. you know, it's one thing that a lot of people don't really enjoy is bottling and washing bottles and priming bottles or, or bulk and it's priming. Just, it's become a lot cheaper. Uh, I, I bought my keg fridge about 10 years ago and it's probably dropped by 30 40% to get into brand new gear where I had to buy secondhand kegs and um, you can't buy secondhand kegs nowadays. <laughs> no, that's right. Yeah, it's, it's hilarious. Now, considering that yeah. home brewers were great at repurposing things, so secondhand kegs are really soft drink kegs. You know, they were Coca-Cola mm. kegs and Pepsi kegs and they yeah. do have little poppets. Um, they get blocked up with hops and sediment and I keep thinking that um, one of my good friends in industry is going to have to innovate on the, the actual 20 litre Cornelius keg but they are great because yeah I think the latest fridges I've seen you can fit four of them in um, so yep. um, no real um, and maybe that can be a topic for a future video how to ferment and dispense from the one vessel in your kegerator um, and I know that's mm-hmm. where it's sort of heading isn't it um, I've seen yep. some pretty cool products coming to the market but um i guess like you said stas it is late we're both um uh you know coming up to the witching hour and um and uh let's uh save those questions for next time and, and encourage everyone to quote the yeah. questions down um in the show notes or drop us an email um service at beerco.com.au or through to you stas and we'll compile another topic uh for our next video sounds good Dermot. Thanks, Stas. Appreciate all your your help and um, have a happy new year for 2021. Yeah, he's hoping that uh, it's smooth sailing. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Thanks, mate. Cheers. Bye.